I'm the son of a tenement dweller, and I'm trying to find out everything I can about the long and shameful history of the Dublin slums. When they sprang up during the 19th century and for a long time afterwards, those slums were breeding grounds of misery and disease. They were dying like flies, it was unbelievable. Galloping consumption, it was called. And just as shocking as how bad they were is the length of time they were allowed to exist. The 70s, they started to knock them down. But Summerhill, Garner Street, Sean McDermott Street, parts of Railway Street were still there. In this program, we expose the greed, corruption, and incompetence which allowed the slum problem to fester for so long and show how public protests finally brought about change. And we also disclose the toll that living in a typically cold and cramped tenement house for just a few days is taking on our family of volunteers. Can we please go home? We had good fun doing this, but, you know, please let it end. For the sake of this series, seven members of Dublin's Winston family are spending a long weekend inside the dilapidated tenement house where some of them grew up. It's the morning of their final day in the house now, and the family members are recovering from the second night they've spent, all jammed in together in this cramped and freezing room. They've slept much better than they did the night before, but there's a distinct sense of unhappiness in the air, all the same. Obviously, we're less enthusiastic today about the whole thing, you know. It's like, can we please go home? We had good fun doing this, but, you know, please let it end. It's different being told the stories, you know, to live in it, like, you know, the reality of it is completely different, you know. Things make the old memories out of it, no doubt about it, but I can't wait to go home. The Winstons are finding out just how tough tenement life can be. Few people nowadays could stand conditions like this for more than a couple of days. And yet generations of Dubliners had to put up with worse, far worse in many cases, and not just for a week or a month, but for the whole of their lives. Behind that fact lies a crucial question. The scale of Dublin's housing problem was apparent to almost everyone from the middle of the 19th century onwards. So how come effective action to tackle it wasn't taken until the 20th century was drawing to a close? In search of an answer, we need to go back to a time when Ireland was subject to British rule. When Dublin first began to develop slums of a seriously worrying size, back in 1860s and 1870s, the centre of political power on the island of Ireland was right here in Dublin Castle. Every one of the high-ranking Britons who held sway here, all the Lord Lieutenants, all the Chief Secretaries, they all knew about the slum problem. And every one of them could have at least tried to do something about the situation. But because they didn't care about what was going on here or their superiors at Westminster didn't, None of them did. This failure to act is seen by many as a grave dereliction of duty on Britain's part. Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, and the conditions in the city were also the responsibility of, of the British government and of the House of Commons, and they failed the people of Dublin in an atrocious manner. It seems to me, though, that just as much blame attaches to the men, the Irish men, who pursued political careers inside the building which stands right next door to Dublin Castle, Dublin City Hall. The ground floor of the building is dominated by statues of great Irish patriots like Daniel O'Connell. The local councillors who oversaw Dublin's affairs from here, from the 1850s onwards, modelled themselves on men like him but their standards of behavior fell a long way short. 
Dublin Corporation was almost despicably corrupt by the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's quite clear that those, for example, who would have been in a position to do something about social conditions, to do something about housing, were far too compromised by their own particular interests, by their own particular status as property owners. In the report of the Departmental Committee in 1913, three of them in particular were named and shamed. Alderman O'Reilly, who owned nine tenement houses, Alderman Corrigan, who owned 19, and Councillor Crozier, who owned 18. But there were 10 other members of the City Council who also owned between one and three tenement houses each. And ironically, the corporation's own sanitary officers had condemned most of these properties as unfit for human habitation. Dublin's corrupt councillors didn't only pressurise the city's health inspectors into turning a blind eye to the appalling conditions that prevailed inside the tenement houses they owned. They also failed to ensure that equally bad properties owned by other landlords were torn down and replaced with decent homes. Dublin Corporation did knock down some slum properties around the turn of the last century and build some new houses but not on the scale that was required. In the 30 years up until 1913, the corporation had succeeded in housing less than 1,400 families. In 1913, it was found that the city urgently required 14,000 houses. So you can see that over a 30 year period, it had made a very, very, very small inroads into the problem. In all fairness to the members of Dublin Corporation, their ability to tackle the city's housing problem was seriously limited, both by the lack of funds and also because of the difficulty in determining who exactly owned which tenement house. But one thing is quite clear, they could have, and indeed they should have done an awful lot more than they did to defend the interests of Dublin's poor. All the more reason then that they might have taken notice of the slogan at the foot of that statue over there. It conveys a message that Dublin's slum-owning alderman obviously never learned. The housing crisis that resulted from the corporation's failure to provide decent accommodation for working-class people was eased, to some extent at least, by people like the Guinness family. In the early 1900s, they financed the construction of ivy buildings one of the most ambitious housing schemes completed in Dublin before the First World War. 250 working-class families were housed in the building when it opened in 1904, and one of the flats has been preserved as a kind of museum. Liam Finnegan of the Ivy Trust is showing me around. Oh, wow. Impressive, isn't it? Oh, this is great. So who was it lived here? The Malloy family. The Malloy family, family. yeah. They would have lived here continuously from 1915 till 2002. Right. And who was the last person to live here then? Nellie Malloy. Uh, we have a picture of her as a young lady here. Oh, right. Yeah. That's her. Yeah. Yeah. And did she live here on her own at the end? At the end, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about this room here and we're talking about two other rooms, two, two, two rooms. bedrooms, That's as it were. It, yeah. Now, in the, at the time when Nellie was with her mum and dad, how many were actually living in here altogether? You'd have had eight people. So six, six, mom and dad and six children. Well, I'd love to have a look around and see what the accommodation sure, yeah. actually was. So this is, uh, this is obviously a bedroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tiny as it is, the flat is well equipped and well laid out. Any working class Dubliner would have been glad to live here. But only a small minority of tenement dwellers were fortunate enough to be rehoused in flats like this. Strict rules governed who was and wasn't eligible for them and most people found themselves on the wrong side of the line. Maureen Johnston grew up in the area known as the Liberties, where a rich philanthropist called the Earl of Meath had built some highly desirable artisan's dwellings. She's never forgotten how hard it was to get hold of one. You had to either be a Protestant or in good employment and you 
couldn't drink. You had to be kind of teetotal. And these were all the rules that were, you know, laid down. We couldn't apply for any of these houses because my great-grandfather, he worked in a tobacco factory just off Francis Street. And he, he drank an awful lot. And then my granny's husband uh, had two horses and he used to sell coal and he drank an awful lot. <laughs> we never, ever were eligible for a decent house, according to the Earl of Mead standards anyway. The moralistic attitude of those who ran the charitable housing scheme set up by the Guinnesses and the Earl of Meath wasn't their only flaw. The very scale of the schemes meant they were never going to be anything else but a sticking plaster on a gaping wound. What was needed was a much more coordinated response to the housing crisis. And for one brief moment in 1913, during the famous lockout, it looked as if that response was actually on the cards. The Dublin lockout of 1913, in which the great trade unionist Jim Larkin played a pivotal role, was an explosive moment in Irish history. Starting out as an internal dispute between Dublin's main tram company and its underpaid workforce, it rapidly escalated into something very much like an uprising, one from which no Dubliner could stand aloof. The city is very much divided into the employers and the workers. The Irish Transport and General Workers Union, led by uh, Jim Larkin, against the federated employers, led by William Martin Murphy, who also runs the tram company. Murphy used the weapon of starvation. He hoped that by locking people out from employment, the struggle for everyday existence that was difficult enough would literally become impossible and that the belly would overcome the heart and force people to abandon the message of the union. That didn't happen. Dublin's unionised workers held out bravely for many months, but they paid a heavy price in lost wages and in blood. On Sunday, August the 31st, 1913, Bloody Sunday, as it became known. Police, armed with batons, charged into a crowd of pro-union demonstrators, killing two of them and injuring many more. It was a terrible and shameful event. But another incident involving death and injury, which took place around the same time, has even greater relevance for us. On Tuesday, September the 2nd, 1913, three days after Bloody Sunday, just as the dusk was beginning to fall, two Dublin tenement houses, numbers 66 and 67 Church Street, suddenly collapsed. According to this contemporary account, the only warning people got was a low rumbling sound seconds before. It wasn't enough to make them flee their homes. And although miraculously, all the inhabitants of 67 survived, seven people in the adjoining house died. Needless to say, the tragedy had a huge impact on the families of those who died. But it also had a remarkable effect on public opinion. It wasn't the first time that people were killed in tenement collapse, but the fact that it was happening against this backdrop meant that you had people saying, if people weren't in, in such poverty-stricken uh, conditions, well then, we wouldn't be divided as we are today into two different opposing groups. And if our children lived in the reeking nursery of the tenements, as one of them put it, well, how could we expect that they would not throw stones at the police? So what happens is you have a huge outcry, something must be done, and uh, an inquiry is set up into the condition of the housing of the working class of the people of Dublin. The Dublin Housing Inquiry got underway here at City Hall in October 1913. 
Four skilled inquisitors examined 76 witnesses over the course of 17 days and then drew up a hard-hitting report which they published a few months later. Consisting of 30 pages of analysis and conclusions backed up by almost 400 pages of evidence and illustrated by a number of graphic photographs, the report was a weighty document and a very important one. Many people, especially those who had heard little or nothing about the tenements until that time, were horrified by what its authors revealed. They exposed things like, you know, 70 people relying on one small, obviously insanitary and stinking outside toilet. They gave images of the interior of the dwellings where people were still very often, you know, with a single bed or at, um, even still on blankets and straw. So it was a shocking, shocking expose of how a very, very large proportion of the city's population were, were living. The other thing, of course, that they uh, expose is the fact that Dublin Corporation hasn't exactly um, come out smelling of roses. And in particular, there are a number of aldermen and councillors who are tenement owners. There are in the city 5,188 tenement houses, of which about 3,624 are virtually unfit for human habitation. This report really stirred things up. Not only did it reveal that 16 members of Dublin Corporation were secret slum landlords, it also proved that several of them fraudulently accepted tax rebates for supposedly improving tenement houses, which they'd actually left untouched. So this now was a financial as well as a moral scandal, but it played right into the hands of a local politician who really cared about the poor. The man in question was the chairman of the corporation's housing committee, Alderman Tom Kelly. Alderman Tom Kelly was a particular hero because he came himself from the working classes. He had got a good education, but he never forgot where he came from. So he was in particular behind the drive to get the city council at the time to start building housing for the working classes. The city council wasn't particularly interested in solving the housing problem, but ironically, the collapse of housing in Church Street and the subsequent inquiry opened up the scandal to public opinion, and Tom Kelly seized his chance. The British Parliament in Westminster had given local councils permission to raise money for working-class housing schemes a short time before. Taking full advantage of this, Tom Kelly drew up plans for several ambitious projects. Work on them was about to begin when events on the world stage intervened. With the outbreak of the First World War, really, we have uh, a disastrous situation. The chairman of the Housing Committee writes a plea, a desperate plea, as he puts it, uh, to Westminster and, and points out that the men who are risking their lives in the trenches, how could you expect them to come back and live in these appalling conditions? But the circumstances were very extreme. And although the corporation does manage to keep a kind of a skeleton housing program going during the war, that's all it is, a skeleton program. There are lots of schemes I've come across about 14, 15 schemes which are ready to run in that 1914, 1915 period. The plans are drawn up, the schemes are there, places like, for example, Sheriff Street, and they're delayed. They're delayed and in many cases abandoned. So, you know, what if? If the war hadn't intervened at that particular point, I think the housing crisis would have been tackled um, in a much more comprehensive manner than in fact happened. And as if the war wasn't a big enough problem, events in Ireland soon put further obstacles in the Housing Committee's way. 1914, the Great War breaks out. Not long after that, then, of course, you've got 1916 and all the historical events that take place after that that lead to independence. So the whole issue became sidelined as other events overtook them. 
We have a situation by the early 1920s where not only has Ireland suffered the same as the rest of Western Europe from the Great War and, and all of, of, of the repercussions of that, but also we've had added to that the tragedy of the Civil War and uh, the War of Independence. So you've had a, a huge uh, upheaval in the life of the city at this time. And with the city centre destroyed, now the corporation has another series of problems to address. Inside Seven Henrietta Street, the female members of the Winston family are taking a trip down memory lane. Okay, I'll stick together. Oh, look, this is where the dogs used to be. They used to They've decided to explore the dark and dingy basement where the older women's late father, James, a carpenter, used to have his workshop. Oh, look at this. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, all the times since the been The size of the fireplace. Look at that. He had all his workbenches here. He had his machines here, he used to make his cabinets. All the Winstons have fond memories of James who was a fine singer as well as a skilled craftsman. He lived a full and rewarding life, one that began in turbulent times. Like his wife, Annie, James was born in the 1920s, making him a child of the Irish Free State. That state had a very difficult start, as we all know, but there was quite a lot of optimism around during its early years all the same. People looked forward to a brighter future now that British rule had come to an end. But many of them had their hopes dashed. When the new state came in, after the, the Black and Tans were gone, and there was nothing left behind, only poverty. But that poverty still carried on under the Irish government. The independent state that was fought for by those people that went out in 1913 was not the free state that they got. Um, the common and ale government was mean, narrow, self-serving in class terms, and the vast majority of people's lives did not particularly improve. The conditions that people lived in all across Ireland and particularly all across Dublin remained appalling in the early years of the Irish free state. The money, resources, time, energy was devoted to political and constitutional issues and not necessarily to looking after the lives of the people who lived along the breadline. Slowly but surely, the question of what to do about the tenements began to slide down the political agenda. When the provisional free state government comes in, the very first act is to declare a million pound grant for housing. But that's not just about slum housing, that's about middle-class housing as well. So you have a dilution in terms of dealing with or addressing the specific slum problem. Slum clearance is not prioritised to the extent uh, that it should have been. And there's a wider issue here also about the uh, priorities of both Common and Gwale and later Fianna Fáil around the idea of rural Ireland versus urban Ireland. And you've got to keep this context at the back of your mind all of the time. If you consider the dominant ideology uh, of, of Irish nationalism, it's very rural based. You don't have urban dwellers organised as effectively as historically you had people from rural Ireland. Dublin Corporation did provide new homes for working class Dubliners as time went by. But the social housing the corporation constructed during the 1930s and 40s didn't always meet people's needs. The main problem with the new estates was their location. They weren't situated in Dublin itself, but in semi-rural areas just outside the city's boundaries. Crumlin to the southwest saw the construction of huge amounts of new housing from the early 1930s on, as did Cabra on the other side of the Liffey. Later on, two other areas, Ballyfermot in the south and Finglas in the northwest were heavily developed as well. The inner city residents who found themselves being transported to these far-flung places had grave difficulty in adjusting to their changed circumstances. 
People were used to generations of inner city living and they found it quite alarming to be transplanted to the countryside as Crumlin and Cabra were then. <laughs> the cattle market was near Cabra, for example, and the children were afraid of the cows because they'd never seen anything like, like that before. We got a house in Crumlin. You know, I remember when we went out there first, it was all fields around us, and there used to be cows in, that, in them. We used to be up the fields playing with them. All my cousins used to call us cultures. Because, <laughs> you know, they thought we were miles out in the country, you know? Former tenement dwellers might have found moving out of the inner city and settling in the new suburbs somewhat easier if they'd boasted job opportunities, proper amenities and good transport links to central Dublin. But these were all things the new areas conspicuously lacked. They're built with the, an idea of having, say, um, uh, tram lines from Crumlin into the city centre, from Valley Farm into the city centre. The initial planning, you know, thinks of these kind of high-speed, efficient transport networks. And like so often, I'm afraid they don't follow. My mum, you know, she felt very isolated you know, when she went out there, because she didn't see anybody. Like, moving away from all your family like that, it's, uh, it was hard for her, you know? As the drawbacks of the outlying areas became more apparent, the residents of inner-city streets like this started to reject the idea of moving out to them. As a health worker who regularly visited tenement houses to help pregnant women recalls, I asked one of the women, why didn't she go to Ballyfermot or one of the new housing areas where her uh, people were being sent to? And um, she said, she said, no, she said, I couldn't do that because my mother lives across the road and my sister lives down the road and my cousin lives off of me. She said, we had a cousin. She went to Ballyfermot and she couldn't afford to come in on the bus. So she said she had to stay out there, so we lost contact with her. Here we're all one big fat. Happy family, she said, don't ask them to send me out there. The Winston family decided to stay put in the inner city. Those who took the opposite course often regretted their decision later on. You're going to a far better environment where there was a bat. You're going to where there was running water. But still in all, I often heard them said, it's not like the old days. That's the way they said, it's not like the old days. I wish I was back in this. People cried, hugged one another, said goodbye, you know, as they were going out to these places, like, you know, somebody never come back, you know. It, was, it broke the hearts of many a people. Many of those who moved away from the inner city missed the warmth and camaraderie of the tenements, that's clear enough. And for those who stayed on in streets like this, at least they had that for comfort. But looking at it from purely material terms, their lives continued to be grim. And not just during the 1930s and 40s, but for several decades afterwards as well. The 1950s was a particularly testing period for Dubliners and for the Irish people as a whole. In the 1950s, Ireland almost went bankrupt. 500,000 people, or as close as makes no difference, left the country. Unemployment level was extraordinary. This was a poor state, an impoverished state, a state which did not manage to find a way of making money with which to raise the levels and the livelihoods of its people. There's so many out of the street here went on the boat to England. Some of them never came back. They remained in England for the rest of their lives. And the government, they didn't really give a damn. As Ireland teetered on the brink of national disaster, Dublin Corporation's attempts to rehouse the urban poor continued to backfire. Aware of how unpopular the effort to move people out had become, the corporation had switched by now to erecting blocks of flats closer to the heart of the city. But these two left a lot to be desired. The likes of Trees' Garden and Fatty Mile Mansions, you still had people living on top of each other. Why do you call them gardens? I don't know. Or mansions or stuff like that. Because they certainly weren't mansions and they didn't have any gardens. Mm -hmm. 
there was a block which I called Hell's Kitchen in a book called Does Your Mother? And they were single room apartments with communal wash houses. And I'm saying to you, no priest, no bishop, no member of the Catholic Church knew where this place was because they didn't want to know. They never stepped across the threshold, and I did. I knew the people lived there, and I cannot tell you how desperate it was. And things were no better in the privately rented sector, on which many people continue to depend. I remember a particular house in Gardner Street where there was a, just, just a great big hole in the floor, and they were paying top shilling for the rent. It wasn't that they were living for half nothing where maybe they could have put something on the floor. And if you challenged the landlord, you'd be out on your ear that night because there was a queue of people waiting for it, hole in the floor and all, because it was a roof. The hundreds of subdivided 18th century houses that had provided woefully inadequate accommodation for generations of Dubliners were now, quite simply, falling apart. Another tragedy seemed to be on the cards, and one duly occurred. The collapse of two tenement houses in 1963, exactly 50 years after the Church Street disaster, seemed to demonstrate that nothing had improved in Dublin during the whole of that time. The deaths of two young children produced a wave of sympathy, and Dublin Corporation responded by demolishing dozens of unfit dwellings. But this reduced the housing supply still further, making the situation even worse. And that leads really, ultimately, to the completely different and radical approach to the housing problem, to build on a greenfield site at the city, uh, city's edge, at the absolute edge of the city, and to build high-rise for the first time. The radical approach was Ballymun. It should have been a fresh start, but it wasn't. An urban regeneration program has improved the area greatly in recent years. For a very long time, though, it was bedeviled by social problems. Crime, unemployment, drug abuse, and more. And I was there when the seeds of that disaster were sown. In the mid-1960s, shortly before Ballymun was erected, I told my parents that I wanted to be an actor. They only agreed to let me try on condition that I acquire a proper skill as well. They arranged for me to train as an electrician, and one of the first things I did as part of my apprenticeship was help to wire up these flats. I had a very strong feeling, like many of my workmates at the time, that the Ballymun we were helping to build might have a lot of problems further down the line. Certainly the materials and the techniques we were using were new to Ireland, but we could see that there were not enough facilities for the people who were going to live here. Still. I expect the planners and the politicians who dreamt it all up were convinced that they were building a brave new world. In planning Ballymun, the City Council sent a delegation to Scandinavia to look at the latest housing developments there, which were also these tower blocks. So it was considered to be the very latest, highly modern and very effective at housing large numbers of people in a very small area. And it's hard to believe, but at the time when Ballymun was built, the country was extremely proud of it. And the towers were named after the seven signatories of the 1916 proclamation, because this was part of the 50th anniversary celebrations. One of the saddest ironies, perhaps, of the decision to mark the 50th anniversary of the 1916 rising in a housing context was that, that you would build these huge blocks, that you would name them after the signatories of the uh, proclamation, but then they just left them there. They didn't follow up with any kind of the proper planning that was needed for the infrastructure, the services that were needed to create viable communities. So the buildings become more important than the actual lives around those buildings. And of course, that created uh, huge problems and ultimately was regarded as one of the great failures of housing and of planning. 
While Ballymun was starting to develop the wide range of social problems for which it would become infamous later on, here in the inner city, things were going from bad to worse. Quite simply, there wasn't enough decent housing to go around, and everyone was in competition with everyone else. At the very bottom of the ladder were council tenants who couldn't afford to pay their rent. For them, life was unbelievably harsh. I never thought the corporation would have such a small place for people to live in, especially with three children. I wouldn't put a, a dog into them. Now, that's the truth of God, I wouldn't. On the floor, we are sleeping, and we've got rugs and undress, and by God, it's cold when you're sleeping on the floor. This TV documentary, still shocking after more than 40 years, gives a flavor of what life was like inside Mount Pleasant buildings, a dumping ground for council tenants who'd fallen behind with their rent. Uh, this is our toilet facilities here at the night time. This is what we have to use. My brother and myself has to go outside, and my wife and my sister has to use this. I can't let them go out. This, this was a bleak vista indeed, but the documentary did offer a hint of hope. Those denied proper housing had been notably reluctant to protest about their situation in the past. The film showed that this, at least, was starting to change. I entirely blame Dublin Corporation for this. There's three million people in Ireland. They say they have 5,000 on the house. Well, that's why can't they house them? They say they're building office blocks overnight. What's more important, office blocks are human beings. This is their purgatory, and a crowded purgatory. In the late 1960s, growing disquiet over the scale of Dublin's housing problems began to take on an organized form. Just one room, reducing costs. You could look at Dublin at the end of the 1960s, and you could identify uh, those living in conditions that really had not changed substantially uh, in 50 or 60 years, which I think is why you get the very concerted, uh, politicized uh, campaign by the Dublin Housing Action, Com Action Committee to highlight and to create embarrassment about the continuity of Irish poverty. The Constitution of Ireland, 1937, Article 41 provides that the family shall be protected. A loose coalition of homeless people, concerned citizens and committed Republicans, the Housing Action Committee, deployed tactics which mirrored those of other protest movements of the time. We began a campaign in terms of organising marches, uh, demonstrations, and very effectively, I think, drew public attention to the fact that there was a serious housing situation in Dublin and that the corporation and the government needed to get their act together to do something about it. The day of action, if you like, uh, that we picked was the 19th of January 1969, because that was the 50th anniversary of the declaration of the first Thal. And that promised equality and all sorts of things for the citizens, um, almost none of which had been achieved in 50 years. all got arrested and, and right enough the headlines on the Herald were not that de Valera had celebrated the, 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 the greatness of the first all but that a whole lot of people had been arrested protesting about housing and that was what we wanted to raise awareness of the problem because it's hard to believe now but there was no awareness of this problem. The Housing Action Committee accomplished its main aim. Public awareness of Dublin's housing problem did increase and new homes were built. But many areas of extremely poor housing lingered on, especially in the northern part of the inner city, right the way through the 1970s and into the 1980s. Summerhill, Garner Street, Sean McDermott Street, parts of Railway Street were still there. They were still there. In the tenements in Summerhill and Sean McDermott Street, there were the same tenements that Sean O'Casey wrote about in his Dublin trilogy, you know, The Plan of the Stars and Juno and the Paycock. Um, there were people in those, some flat complexes, that didn't have, they had a, a, the sink to wash themselves in. There were no bathrooms, no showers. And that was one of the main issues that brought Tony Gregory into politics. Tony Gregory, the long-serving independent TD for the central Dublin constituency who died in 2008, 
did more than anyone else to bring about the final eradication of the Dublin tenements. Have you decided how you're going to vote this afternoon? I have, but I'm preparing a statement, just finalising the statement. If we have it ready, we'll give it out before I go into the dial. But could you give any indication? In February 1982, he reached a famous agreement with Charles Hawhey, who needed one more vote in the Doyle to become Taoiseach. Gregory lent Hawhey his support, but only after forcing him to set aside a massive amount of public money to improve the housing situation inside his hard-pressed constituency. The agreement has gone down in history as the Gregory Deal. It was criticized at the time by other TDs, but Tony Gregory didn't care. When he stood up in the Doyle and he was mentioning the various parts in the Gregory Deal, I think somebody called out, what about the rest of the country? But he didn't owe anybody an apology because this was a social injustice that had been allowed to fester for so long. And he was just doing, he was doing what was morally right for those people who had been living in appalling conditions, the same conditions, as I said, that they were there in the 1900s. In the wake of the Gregory Deal, the age of the tenements finally came to an end. This could have happened a good deal sooner, in my view, if any of those who held power in Ireland from the 1920s onwards had shown even half the determination that Tony Gregory showed. Yes, we were a poor nation for much of that time. Yes, we lacked industry, we lacked capital, we lacked entrepreneurial skill. But the most important thing we lacked, in my view, was a political class with the clear-sightedness to recognise social injustice when they saw it, and the courage and the desire to stamp it out. Nearly 30 years after the Gregory deal, and almost 40 years after they and their parents moved out of Henrietta Street for the first time, the older members of the Winston family are about to bid a second farewell to the world of the tenements. <laughs> Coming back to their childhood home has been a memorable experience for them and for their younger relatives. It has made them all think very deeply about their lives and the lives of those who came before them. What did I expect when I went in there? I, I think I wanted to feel what I felt when I was told we were moving from Henrietta Street. I remember being broken-hearted. And all these years, I felt I was... I left something behind, that I was really missing something from there, you know. But after being there this weekend, I think... Maybe I need to rethink that one. <laughs> I don't think I'm missing out on too much. <laughs> you do that. Living in that kind of cold and only having the bare essentials, I don't think I'd wish it on anybody, you know, because it was hard. And we were just there by ourselves. Could you imagine us with children trying to get through that? Them times were really, really, really tough for them. But, I mean, I know I'm from good stock, and I know that that's where good stock came from. So I'm really, really, really proud to be part of all of that and have to come from the tenements. It makes me very proud to be a part of this family, the Winston's. Be a part of the Henrietta Street gang. You know, like, they, they had feck all, really, you know. Lucky to get some bread and jam, like that was their hi highlight on a Sunday, you know what I mean? Bye. I have to say, when I was walking out of the house, I felt a bit emotional, like, you know, it'll make me appreciate the things that I already have and not to be always looking for more or, you know, I have hot rum and water. I have a warm bed to sleep in every night. You know, I have a roof over my head, you know, and uh, that's all you need. It really is all you need. It's the end of the Winston stay in Henrietta Street and the end of this series. There's just enough time for another member of the family to offer a final thought, a warning to those who think the age of the tenements could never come again. We have loads of tenements. They're building loads of apartment blocks for our town. It won't be long before they have tenements again, I can imagine. <laughs> That's what my father used to have me say. So they're just the te all new tenements they're building. Don't be long before they slums as well. And that could easily happen. Could easily happen now anyway.
So we're heading over to the newsroom next here on three for the day's top stories. Plus Sarah Carey is in the hot seat filling in on tonight with Vincent Brown. So plenty of debate and discussion on the way after the break.